that's kind of conversation between the soul. That's conversation between the soul and the night. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and comrade, Derek Davison, and we are excited to bring you the news. Derek, let's start with the climate. What's going on? Uh, more good news. Uh, there's a study that was just published on Wednesday in a journal called Science Advances. Uh, it says that Earth is operating outside what they called the safe operating space for humanity on six of nine possible measures. Uh, so we're doing great. Uh, we still got three. So, uh, you know, we're hanging on. This uh, updates a previous version of the same study that was published a few years ago that uh, had us only failing on five of the nine measures. We've apparently uh, gotten worse on water since then. So, uh, you know, nothing terribly important. Things are getting better in one category, which is the health of the ozone layer. I know people like to cite the Montreal Protocol as uh, proof uh, that humanity can actually do something about climate change. It's been about 35 years uh, since the Montreal Protocol was agreed, and uh, there's been no evidence uh, since then that we're capable of replicating it. But, um, you know, that's where things stand. I believe we can do it, Derek. I remember in fourth grade, the weekly reader said we would get rid of aerosol cans, and we did it, I think. And now the ozone layer is good, so I have more I faith. think for most things we did, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk a little bit about, about what's going on in Yemen. Uh, yes, this is a story that just uh, came out, broke on Thursday. Uh, a delegation of uh, officials from Yemen's Houthi rebel movement flew to Saudi Arabia on, a, on an Omani plane uh, on Thursday for what is apparently supposed to be a five-day trip. Uh, it's... Not entirely clear what's on the agenda, but one assumes that they and Saudi officials will be talking about uh, a peace deal for, for Yemen. I mean, they've been under a, a ceasefire, de facto ceasefire uh, now for quite some time. Um, the conflict has been quiet for several months. Uh, the Their official ceasefire expired in October, but more or less uh, they have not resumed fighting since then. So, uh, you know, I, hopefully this trip will result in something. I really don't know el what else to say about it because obviously it just began. I mean, they, they just flew out on Thursday. So potentially some good news. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe we'll have something to talk about next week. One could hope. All right, Derek, there's a couple things that's been going on um, with Iran. Uh, why don't you tell us what they are? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we seem to be pretty close to the uh, that prisoner swap that we talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, actually coming to fruition. The Biden administration has issued uh, the sanction wa sanctions waivers necessary to transfer around six billion dollars or so in Iranian money from South Korea to Qatar. Uh, that money will be deposited in Qatari institutions. It will be overseen by the Qatari government and used by the Iranians to purchase non-sanctioned goods, i.e., food, uh, medicine, fuel, that sort of thing. Once those funds are deposited in Qatar, that should trigger the prisoner swap portion of this agreement. There are five U.S. nationals in Iran uh, who will be, they've been already transferred uh, out of prison into house arrest and they'll be allowed to leave the country at that point. Uh, five Iranians who are in U.S. custody will also be released. We don't know who they are at this point. The Iranians have released a list kind of a wish list uh, a few days ago, but uh, there's been no confirmation from the Biden administration yet as to who they are going to be. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But this does seem to be maybe potentially just days away uh, from actually happening. The second thing of note has to do with the nuclear deal. Um, you know, as, as folks may know, Donald Trump, uh, the 2015 nuclear deal, Donald Trump pulled out of it and, and really destroyed it in 2018. It's still sort of the zombie nuclear deal is still there. Uh, and technically, next month, some uh, uh, UN sanctions against Iran are due to expire, We're supposed to sunset as part of the deal, specifically having to do with uh, Iran's ballistic missile program. 
and possibly drones as well. I, I'm not sure that was envisioned in the original deal, but it's it's been considered part of it. The governments of the UK, France, and Germany, who are still technically party to the agreement, the US is, of course, not, announced on Thursday that they will not be allowing those sanctions to lift under the terms of the deal. They're, they're arguing that the Iranians who responded to Trump's move in 2018 and have responded re- by repeatedly uh, kind of let, lowering their compliance with the deal and now are virtually uh, out of compliance with, with most of its uh, provisions, at least, if not all. They're arguing that Iran is so far in breach of the deal, even though that was reactive and the U.S. is the one that breached the deal first, they're arguing that they can't go ahead with, this, uh, with the, the sanctions sunsetting under those conditions. Derek, I love few things. A beautiful sunset, a cold brewski with my bros, and human rights. Why don't you tell us what's been going on with human rights? Uh, well, interestingly, and uh, you're not alone because the Biden administration loves human rights too. The first uh, statement that the State Department put out after Joe Biden took office was titled Putting Human Rights at the Center of U.S. Foreign Policy. Uh, on that note, I think it's uh, interesting there's, there's been a few developments specifically in the Middle East, related to the Middle East, uh, over the past several days, one of which is the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are collaborating on a big business deal to secure a supply or a stronger, larger, steadier supply of metals, battery-specific metals like cobalt and lithium from Africa. This would involve the Saudis buying stakes in African mining projects and the U.S. backstopping those purchases by guaranteeing that, that the U.S. will buy some portion of what is produced. This is related to human rights in the sense that Amnesty International just released a statement last week Uh, accusing the Saudi government of being on a relentless killing spree. That's a quote from the the statement. uh, As the kingdom has executed at least 100 people so far in 2023, I think they've uh, executed a couple more this week, so they're now over 100 people. The Saudis generally claim when they carry out these executions that they're for drug-related offenses, uh, but at least one of their high-profile victims uh, this year has been put to death essentially for, for posting negative comments about Mohammed bin Salman on social media, uh, which I think we can all agree is, is worth uh, the, the death penalty. So that's, that's interesting from an administration that is putting human rights at the center of U.S. foreign policy. Now, the second uh, story here that's somewhat related has to do with Egypt. Uh, the Biden administration is, uh, has reportedly decided to withhold $85 million in security assistance to the Egyptian government. Uh, this is out of $1.3 billion that the U.S. sends to Egypt every year. Of that $1.3 billion, $320 million has been set aside by Congress to be conditioned on Egypt's human rights record, which is, of course, terrible, uh, consistently terrible. This $85 million uh, is a portion of that $320 million that is specifically related to the Egyptian government's release of political prisoners. They haven't released any lately, so far as I can tell. It's not subject to sort of the discretion of the administration. So the, the Biden administration really has no choice but to withhold that $85 million. The rest, uh, about $235 million, the administration can still send to Egypt, despite the lousy human rights record, uh, if it deems uh, that it's in the U.S. national security interest to do so. There's been a lot of push from Congress, from several members of Congress, to withhold that $235 million Uh, But the Biden administration has not commented, and uh, I'm going to say it's unlikely uh, that it will. It may withhold some small uh, token amount, but I doubt that they would withhold the full amount. So uh, more human rights activity in the Middle East. And finally, another serial human rights abuser, Bahrain, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the Crown Prince of Bahrain, Salman bin Hamad al Khalifa, signed a new bilateral security and economic agreement on Wednesday that includes uh, the U.S. uh, providing Bahrain with uh, additional uh, or expanded what the Washington Post called expanded defense and technology cooperation, intelligence cooperation. Uh, There are uh, provisions for Bahrain to be included in a new shipping corridor that the U.S. is backing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So basically uh, improving, tightening, strengthening the bilateral relationship. The administration has suggested that this could be a template 
for agreements with other Gulf states, or perhaps it could be expanded to include other Gulf states. But uh, the Bahraini government, if you uh, do five minutes of Googling online, you will see is uh, one of the worst human rights abusers in a region of, of really poor human rights abusers. And so uh, another example of the Biden administration putting human rights at the center of U.S. foreign policy. Thanks, Derek. Uh, let's talk about the meeting between Kim and Putin. Yes, Kim Jong-un, North Korean leader, headed off to Russia and met with Vladimir Putin uh, at the Vostochny Cosmodrome, which is located in eastern Russia's uh, Amur Oblast. We're not entirely sure what they discussed. The fact that it was at the Cosmodrome suggests that space uh, exploration was part of the part of the agenda. Uh, we know what they've publicly said they talked about. Putin said that he talked with Kim about providing North Korea with assistance in constructing satellites. Kim has made uh, getting a spy satellite into orbit a priority, and the North Koreans have tried, uh, I believe, three times so far this year. They've all failed. Uh, all three attempts have failed uh, to get a satellite into orbit. Putin also mentioned the idea of uh, the Russians putting a North Korean cosmonaut into space. Uh, so definitely space was on the agenda. Now, the U.S. has been saying for months now and, and had warned just last week that this meeting was coming. They've been saying for months that, that Putin wants to buy weapons from North Korea to use in Ukraine. And this is kind of an interesting fact of the Ukraine war is it's become so, so much an artillery battle. Uh, and artillery is considered relatively primitive by modern military standards that the Russians don't make enough artillery shells on their own to really keep up with the demand. They're, they're depleting their stockpiles. North Korea makes a ton of artillery. That's one of their main deterrents uh, is their short-range artillery that they have trained on Seoul uh, in the event of, of some kind of conflict with the U.S. and or South Korea. Uh, so they produce a ton of the stuff, and uh, Putin wants this based on probably old Soviet models, I would assume. So Putin wants this stuff uh, because it's compatible with Russian guns and this has been, as I say, something that the U.S. government has been talking about for months now, the possibility uh, that North Korea and Russia would come to some kind of an agreement. One presumes that that was part of the discussion. Obviously, they didn't openly acknowledge that after their meeting. That suggests that there are some other things on the table besides just satellite assistance and, and putting a North Korean cosmonaut in space. Um, North Korea would, would, I'm sure, happily accept in addition to just basic aid, food, and that sort of thing, uh, would happily accept Russian assistance with its uh, submarine programs, uh, its missile program, possibly with its nuclear weapons program. The North Koreans, it's believed, are pursuing a tactical nuclear warhead, which they have yet to produce. So there are a lot of other things that may have been involved in the, the, this conversation. We simply don't know uh, what else they talked about. Thanks, Derek. Uh, let's talk about the African disaster block of Libya and Morocco. Yes. So this has been uh, a bad week, basically, for uh, the people of Morocco and Libya. We'll start, I guess, with Libya. A Mediterranean cyclone. These are uh, hurricane or tropical storm, I should say, like events that do sometimes occur in the Mediterranean. This one had been, it's called was called Storm Daniel. It had been kind of circulating around the Mediterranean. It hit Greece, parts of Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria, uh, did a lot of flooding damage, especially in those places, uh, slammed into eastern Libya on Tuesday and then uh, weakened it and dissipated. The death toll here is massive. Uh, the Libyan Red Crescent just on Thursday said it can now uh, track at least 11,300 deaths due to flooding in the city of Derna in northeastern Libya. Uh, the, the torrential rain that the storm brought caused a number of dams in Derna to fail, which caused the flooding that, that has caused all these deaths. There are, you know, the saying is there are no truly natural disasters, and this is uh, undoubtedly a case where that's true. Derna, uh, these dams have, have reportedly not been maintained for decades, uh, certainly in the last, let's say, 12 years since uh, the Libyan government, such as it was, fell apart into civil war. Uh, there's been little, if anything, done to keep these dams in good working order. The relief effort that's now underway and that needs to be pretty intensive, even to clear 
this huge amount of, of bodies off the streets before disease starts to become an issue. That's being overseen by nothing, really. I mean, there's no stable Libyan government. There are two competing Libyan governments, which means there's none. Uh, so it's not even clear who's going to administer uh, the cleanup effort, the recovery effort. So this is definitely a, a political crisis as well as uh, a natural disaster. Uh, now, in Morocco, a magnitude 6.8, uh, give or take, I've seen 6.9 by some uh, estimates, earthquake uh, struck the Marrakesh Safi region in Morocco on Friday. That death toll, the last time I checked, was over 2,800 people. It's probably risen uh, since the last time I, I saw anything about this. There's also been criticism here of the government's disaster response effort. The Moroccan government, it's a monarchy. It's not terribly nimble. Uh, it's not terribly welcoming to uh, of foreign assistance. And so it took a long time for government relief teams to arrive in isolated villages. And, and this is a fairly uh, outside of the, the city of Marrakesh. It's, it's a somewhat rural, uh, kind of disconnected region. So it took a long time for disaster relief teams to arrive in many of these places. The Moroccan government has been somewhat inexplicably selective about accepting foreign assistance. There have been a number of countries that have offered and they've only accepted from uh, a handful of them. So that's also slowed, I think, the potential response. Uh, I do want to say we will have links in the show description to uh, a place where you can donate for both Moroccan disaster relief and Libyan disaster relief. So uh, please, if you're able to uh, do that. Thanks, Derek. And we should have that information in the show notes, right? Yes. Perfect. Uh, let's talk about Mali and the new uprising that's been going on in the north. Yes. Uh, a group called the Coordination of Azawad Movements, uh, its French acronym is CMA, uh, which is comprised of, it's sort of an umbrella group for a number of former rebel factions that participated in the 2012 uprising in northern Mali. Primarily, these are Tuareg groups. Uh, there are some Arab groups as well. They gave a statement to the media on Monday describing themselves, describing their group as in what they called a time of war with Mali's uh, military government. The CMA and uh, the junta that rules Mali have been uh, at odds increasingly over the past several months. The CMA accuses the junta of not abiding by the terms of the 2015 agreement that ended that uprising. Uh, in northern Mali, uh, with the exception of Islamist groups that that kept fighting. It's gotten worse in recent weeks because uh, the junta ordered the United Nations to pull its peacekeepers out of Mali. And the peacekeepers had primarily been based in the north since that 2015 deal as part of the 2015 deal. Uh, they were there to, to make sure that nothing flared up again between these uh, rebel factions and the government. Now they're leaving uh, in a fairly haphazard, quick way. The, the junta wants them out by the end of the year. And this is a large peacekeeping operation. So it's it's uh, not easy to wind that down, even in, in a matter of a few months. So that's added to the tensions between the junta uh, and the government. Now on, I believe, Tuesday, uh, which was the day after the CMA announced that it was in this time of war uh, with the government. The same group, the CMA, claimed that its fighters had captured military outposts in a town called Burem, which is situated not far outside of the city of Gao, just north of Gao. Uh, and they then withdrew from the town, probably because of their vulnerability to, to military airstrikes, and so that that may be uh, the first indication that this declaration of time of war was not just rhetoric. It was actually uh, it's actually real. And this uh, the uprising in northern Mali has uh, resumed after several years. All right, Derek, uh, thank you. Let's talk about Ukraine now. And apparently Uncle Sam is sending over some long range artillery. Yes, I think people are familiar with the pattern now. Uh, the Ukrainians request something and the Biden administration says, no, we're not going to do that. And then they keep requesting or demanding a particular weapon. The administration starts to weaken over time and eventually gives in and, and supplies the Ukrainians with what they want. This has happened with multiple rocket launchers, the Abrams tank, 
cluster bombs, the F-16 now. So it's been a, a pretty consistent pattern over the course of this conflict. Uh, ABC News reported on Saturday that the administration is about to cave in on another one of these demands, this time for what is known as the Army Tactical Missile System. Uh, now, this is not a, a weapons platform. It's a munition. Uh, it's, a, a, as it says, a missile that, that can be used with the multiple rocket launchers that the the U.S. has provided to Ukraine, uh, it would increase dramatically increase the range of those systems uh, from what they are right now with the the weapons, the the munitions the U.S. has provided so far, uh, would increase that range up to about 300 kilometers or 190 miles. Uh, this would enable the Ukrainians to hit targets well behind uh, the Russian lines, which could bring, uh, you know, uh, command and control facilities, uh, uh, air air bases or air facilities, uh, you know, various other other types of things e- within their range, uh, and could force the Russians to pull those things even further back from the front line, uh, which uh, could have some implications for the situation uh, along the particularly the area where the Ukrainians have been pushing their counteroffensive. Uh, the administration has been resisting so far this demand because of fears that uh, the Ukrainians would use uh, weapons with this kind of range to attack targets inside Russia. Apparently, uh, supposedly they've uh, pinky swore that they would not do that. So, uh, you know, who knows? But as I say, the the, the indications are that the, the Biden administration has officially denied that it's it's uh, you know moved off of its position here, but uh, there is reporting now to the effect of we're uh, about to see this happen. And given the pattern that I, I mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, I think it's it's likely that this will happen uh, in in the next few days. One wonders what the Ukrainians will be uh, asking for next. So, Derek, does it look like this is going to be a frozen conflict, a la Kashmir, or is it still too early to tell? Um, I mean, I think it's too early to say it's going to look like Kashmir. That's that's a long time. I mean, that's that's a really frozen conflict. Certainly, I think everybody at this point seems to be preparing for a long war. Putin gave a speech uh, at a, a military defense conference in uh, Vladivostok uh, a couple of days ago and the, to the lucky, lucky audience there. And apparently in the midst of rambling about a variety of topics, including the, the legal case against Donald Trump, uh, he also mentioned that uh, Russia, that he feels at least, and he, you know, he and Russia, uh, I guess, same thing, feel that this is this is a war of attrition now, and that the only way to get a peace deal on Russia's terms uh, is going to be to extend this conflict and wear the wear the Ukrainians down to the point where they have no capacity left to fight, and they're forced to accept Russian terms. The Ukrainians, for their part you know, are still maximally, at least publicly, demanding uh, that Russian forces leave every bit of territory that they've occupied since 2014. They are accepting things, they're they're, they're asking for things like the F-16 that seem to be more kind of long-term projects than things that are going to help in the here and now. So I think at least everybody's settling in for another year plus of this, um, you know, beyond that, I, I don't know, but, but clearly the combatants both seem to be on the same page here in terms of viewing this as a, 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 a thing, a war that's going to last for a while. And, uh, for it to, to last that long, it will have to take on some of the characteristics, I think, uh, of a frozen conflict because you can't keep things up at, uh, at this kind of pace, uh, indefinitely. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's talk about the G20 summit. Yes. Uh, over the weekend, the G20 leaders met in New Delhi, or some of them anyway. Putin was not there. Xi Jinping was not there. You know, as as with all of these gatherings, th- most of the attention was focused on the idea of uh, or on the on kind of watching whether the the gang would be able to produce a statement. Uh, there's so much division within the G20 that it was viewed as, um, I would say, probably 50-50 uh, whether they would do so. In terms of tangible outcomes, the one thing that I've seen was that uh, the G20 uh, admitted the African Union as a new full member. So I don't know, maybe it's the G21 now we should be talking about. Uh, I haven't seen anybody use that terminology, but uh, the AU uh, is now a G20 membership member. It's It's been after 
a G20 membership for a long time. So this is uh, this has been a long time coming. In terms of that final statement, they were able to produce one. It didn't really say very much. Uh, the two big issues on the agenda were Ukraine and climate change. As to Ukraine, there was a, a language that sort of vaguely condemned the idea of wars of aggression and territorial you know, kind of expansion through military means without any specific language about uh, that could be construed as criticizing Russia. On the climate, uh, there was the statement talked about the the need for more clean energy and the benefits of clean energy, but said nothing about transitioning away from fossil fuels, which is what is really necessary to stop rampant climate change. Uh, so it was pretty mealy mouthed. Now, the fact that they reached any statement at all was seen as a, a sort of feather in the cap for the host India. Uh, the summit was held in New Delhi, uh, was seen as sort of a, uh, an indication of India's diplomatic clout, maybe rising diplomatic clout by virtue of the fact that they were able to agree on a statement or they were able to kind of encourage agreement on a statement at all. Thank you, Derek. Uh, good news, everyone. There's a lot going on with the new Cold War this week. Why don't we start with the proposed U.S. backed, of course, India Europe shipping network? Yes, this was announced on the sidelines of the G20. Uh, I, it, it's so it, you may consider it another tangible outcome of that summit. It's not really tangible because who knows if it's ever going to actually come to fruition. But this is a new project that's backed by the U.S. Uh, that would build a freight network to move commodities, goods, whatever, uh, from the Persian Gulf to Israel. Uh, so it would connect Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, apparently in this new agreement that Blinken signed with Crown Prince, uh, would be involved somehow. Uh, it would connect those countries with Israel by freight rail. It would then build or, or build out sea transport networks to broaden this network to include India and Europe. So the full network would run uh, from India to Europe. Uh, it would run over 3,000 miles. Obviously, I think you can view this as a an effort to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you can also view it as, a, as an effort to uh, help stitch Saudi Arabia and Israel further together, even if they're not yet ready to to formally, you know, if the Saudis aren't ready to formally diplomatically recognize Israel, this is still another way to kind of bring them closer together. And to build out regionally, I mean, to build what, what the U.S. has been constructing here, which is basically an anti-Iran alliance, that's probably what the Bahrain Agreement was part of as well. So, you know, a lot of things happening here, but I think definitely a new Cold War component because this is clearly a, an effort to counter as I say, counter Belt and Road and to counter Chinese influence uh, in the Middle East uh, and to build on this burgeoning relationship uh, between the U.S. and India, which has a lot to do also with kind of a shared antipathy toward China. Thanks, Derek. Uh, let's talk about Biden's visit to Vietnam. Yes, uh, Biden went to Vietnam on Sunday after he left the G20, where he oversaw uh, the official upgrading of Vietnamese-U.S. relations to what is called the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Level. This puts Vietnam's relationship with the U.S. on the same level as its relationship with Russia and China. Uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot in, in a practical sense. What it's meant primarily to do is to encourage U.S. businesses to invest in Vietnam uh, by showing how stable and strong the political ties uh, between those two countries are. Uh, again, I think there's a new Cold War component here. Vietnam, along with a number, number of other countries in the South China Sea, increasingly view the U.S. as a counterweight to China, which, uh, as you may know, has very expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea that conflict with the claims of a, num a number of other states around that body of water. Uh, now, Vietnamese-Chinese relations are very strong. They're, as I said, they're, you know, they were already at the comprehensive strategic partnership level. They're still friendly. Uh, there's nothing to indicate that this is, uh, that the Vietnam and the U.S. are strengthening ties at the expense of Vietnamese-Chinese ties uh, or anything like that. And I'm not, I wouldn't expect the U.S. military to be moving into Vietnam anytime soon or anything like that. Uh, but it is clear that these tensions over the competing claims in the South China Sea are fueling uh, or causing countries in that region to kind of expand their relationships with the U.S. So definitely another 
uh, new Cold War theater here. Thanks, Derek. And why don't we uh, finish the new Cold War segment with talking about Maduro's visit to China? Yes. On the flip side of this, Nicolas Maduro, the Venezuelan president, visited China on Wednesday, and uh, he and Xi Jinping signed a number of cooperation agreements uh, focused on uh, trade, commerce, uh, tourism, uh, other economic cooperation. Uh, and she, uh, kind of mirroring what happened uh, with the U.S. and Vietnam, she declared that uh, China's relationship with Venezuela is what he called an all-weather strategic partnership, which is, again, the term of art that, that China uses to describe its most important, closest geopolitical relationships. So uh, another, you know, I'm sure this will, will uh, be well received, of course, in Washington, which has Venezuela under maximum U.S. sanctions, uh, forcing Maduro really to, to look anywhere he can for for relationships and, and support. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll take this in the, the spirit with which it was intended and there won't be any overreaction uh, from D.C. That's what I expect as well. Let's end now on the 9-11 anniversary. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to highlight a, a friend of the show, Spencer Ackerman, and his Forever Wars newsletter did a little uh, reminiscence uh, or sort of commemoration of the uh, 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and therefore of the glorious war on terror. Uh, he noted, and this is where the, uh, you know, where the news I think is, uh, is buried here, but he noted that just before Joe Biden left for the G20 summit on September 7th, so uh, about a week ago, I guess now, he extended the state of emergency that was imposed after 9-11 for, uh, I suppose, another year. It, that state of emergency was imposed on September 14th, 2001. Uh, it would expire, would be set to expire on September 14th, 2023. So uh, we're going to get that. The war on terror is officially continuing for at least another year. Um, you know, as Spencer says, the you don't really need a terrorist threat at this point to justify the war on terror. And in fact, a lot of the things that the United States has done as part of the war on terror has helped to create new terrorist threats, which makes the uh, need to extend the state of national emergency, you know, more acute. So why not? Why not just kind of feed uh, this thing, the tail, the, the, you know, the cat is uh, chasing his tail, I guess. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's where I would uh, uh, say happy 9-11, everybody. And, and we're going to keep on keeping on, I guess, for, uh, for a little while longer. Well, thank you, Derek, and thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.